I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing changemakers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Junada Petras Nasser is a writer, pleasure activist, filmmaker, and performance artist of Black Caribbean descent, born on Dakota land. Her work centers around wildness, queerness, Black diasporic futurism, ancestral healing, sweetness, shimmer, and liberation. She is the co-founder with Erin Sharkey of Free Black Dirt, an experimental arts production company. She is the writer and director of Sweetness of Wild, a poetic episodic film series themed around blackness, queerness, biking, resistance, love, and coming of age in Minneapolis. Her first young adult novel, The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, is a Coretta Scott King Award honor book. She lives in Minneapolis with her wife, child, and family. All right, welcome everybody to Good Ancestor Podcast. I am your host, Leila Saad, and I'm here with the amazing Junada Petrus Nassar. Welcome, Junada. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me here. You know, I'm a huge fan. And um, as I was sharing, it's because you're a gangster. <laughs> and I think there's things that um, you have been able to articulate so soulfully and clearly um, that I, as a Black woman, needed to have affirmed in existence and the ways that you hold white people accountable to their like soulful sort of. I don't know, metronome or standard or something. Like, mm. I was like, okay. And then, of course, you know, we got homies in common. Yes. That was exciting to find out. I can't wait to share with everybody how you and I got connected because I think it's so, it just, to me, speaks so much of, like, the magic that's in your book. And we're going to be talking a lot about your book um, today. Mm. And the magic that is you, essentially, because you are, you, you, you birthed it. You, you put it out there. Um, but before we dive into all of that, Janata, who are some of the ancestors, living or transitioned, familial or societal, who have influenced you on your journey? Hmm. Um, I was thinking about, there's so many ancestors. There's so many ancestors. I've been so abundantly blessed with ancestral energy in my life. And I, I feel that about you. Like that is such a part of your book and your work and the way that you show up. So I'm really curious to know who are, who are these ancestors? Yeah. Cause I was thinking about trees. I was thinking about trees. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about crystals. Cause I had all of these like, you know, human formed right. beings in mind, which I'll share, but um, I was like getting ready, getting cute for this moment and stuff like that with you. Cause I saw, thank God you text or messaged on the gram that you was going to get beat for this interview. So I was like, <laughs> let me get beat. Okay. Um, so I was getting beat and I saw this beautiful amethyst that was mm. on my dresser, you know? And I was like, Oh, you're an ancestor too. You're an ancestor yeah. too. And like from since I've been young, like, you know, rocks, dirt, like bugs, like just those sorts of ancestor teachers, you Mm. know, um, have just been so much of how, so before I even knew how to read, which, you know, reading was such a big part too of like how I got to meet the other ancestors that have touched my soul and touched my work. But like nature itself, you know, was the thing that I felt connected to despite all the other sort of human created noise of like anti-black girlness, anti, you know, wildness, anti-sensuality, like all of the things that would be my sort of hero's journey to deal with. Mm. Like, I feel like nature showed me wildness and the affirmation of it, you know? Um, So yeah, so that's Mm. one. Um, (laughs) Um, and then I have like, so I brought all these books when, um, I was reflecting on this question because for me, like, um, when I did become literate and able to read, um, I was 
blessed that in the context of being born a black girl in the hood in the 80s mm. that all of these bad can I curse on this program? Yes, you can curse. <laughs> Bad bitches, feminist <laughs> writers were out here stunting on this literary like front. Yeah. Um, that like I would get to like absorb the embarrassment of jewels of, you know, because really it's an abundance. Um, so like in you know, Toni Morrison obviously comes to mind, but like Toni Morrison was somebody I got into like later. Yeah. I feel though. Um, she, for me, is super, like, next level in this energy and cerebralness that's at one place, like, in the future, but also so connected to, like, African ancestral storytelling. Like, yes. even the way she goes around literary, like, that was a thing that, like, truly, you know, made me be like, wow, like, A, she's talking about our ancestors yeah. in ways that are, like, sensuous and complicated and poetic. Yeah. Um, but then she's also sort of creating a blueprint of the soul, you know, like a certain kind of clarity of seeing the self, you know, yeah. um, like, so anyways, I have all of these books. And so one of the books I want to show, um, is, um, this book, Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments. Oh, you, no, I haven't. Book? No, oh, gee, I really would love if you got this book. Cause I think it would just like to turn you out. Like it turned me out. Yeah. Um, so when I think of like ancestors, like there's also all of these nameless, um, kind of wild women, free child who like somehow move from off of enslavement or colonization. Cause I'm of Caribbean descent. Yeah. Um, and like we're able to really sort of assert a certain kind of freeness with their bodies, mm. um, with the ways that they loved. And anyhow, this book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, really talks to the like nameless of our ancestors, mm. you know, who were like women like us, you know, who, you know, live lives, who, right. who figured out ways to create lives that were um, tremendously meaningful and rich in spite of all of this. Right. So. Right. You know, I must um, get my, I have to get my hands on that. Who is the um, author of that book? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Sadia Hartman. When I say I put respect on this woman's name. Okay. Because the way she writes this book is so lush and mm. genuine and poetic and humorous and brilliant and triumphant. Like it's super brilliantly written. Like mm. it's written like a textbook. Oh gosh, the content is very dense, as though it were a textbook. Right. But she writes it like a Toni Morrison book. Oh. Like it's wild. Oh, okay. Yes, need it. Sadia Hartman. <laughs> okay. You know. Um, other ancestors, Octavia Butler. Yes. Um, who is a Cancerian? So I'm also really into astrology. Yeah. So like, I'll probably just be astrology dropping people alongside with their names. Good. <laughs> um, because I do feel. Are you into astrology? Um. Uh, so I. Because I don't know my birth time, have not had my birth chart read, so I'm not deep into it. I don't because I don't know all my placements and all of that. But I'm very intrigued by it all. I know my sun mm. sign, and that's about it. You know, what's your sun um, sign? I'm a Sagittarius. Which oh my, I love Sagittarian women. <laughs> I do. I do too. <laughs> They're a fierce bunch. We are. <laughs> We're fire. You know. <laughs> yeah, but you're also like super calculated fire yeah that's yeah you know like yeah, all the yeah. other fire be popping off you'd be like right. chill or right. like come on right. now right but they're like i think that comes through in my writing a lot it's very mm. direct but it pierces <laughs> directly mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah oh yeah <laughs> i know in my book there's a poem about Capricorn or is it Sagittarius? Maybe it is about Sagittarius, about lava. Mm. And you know, like lava, like when it burns, it like burns down things. And you know what I mean? It like, yeah. but like, but you see once it like solidifies, it creates earth. It creates right. like the most beautiful places on, in the world were created by the lava. of. Right. The, so to me, I feel like Sagittarian heat is very volcanic. Yeah. And very like, you know, generative. Yeah. Um, while also like builds foundation. I love you know? that. So. I love that. Yeah. Who is who's who's some of the other books that you've got? Okay, with you? cool. So I have oh my gosh. Okay, so I've been getting like deep diving back into Intozake Shange. So that one is on my list. So that's Sassafras, Cypress, and Indigo. OMG. Yeah. Okay. I'll 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 literally read the first Please. couple of lines just so you can see how yeah. Intozake went in. <laughs> Where there is a woman, there is magic. If there is a moon falling from her mouth, 
She is a woman who knows her magic, who can share or not share her powers. A woman with the moon falling from her mouth, roses between her legs, and tiaras of Spanish moss. This woman is a consort of the spirits. Mm, I've read that one before, and I, I love it. Uh, and it, it reminds me a lot of your writing, actually. And I'm going to tell you, I told you before we hit record that I'm basically going to be gushing on you through this conversation. You just I'm going to let you, speak, gonna let you yeah. speak first and let you share, you know, your answers. No, I, I like it both because I feel like always so awkward in these well, things. I'm like, I, yeah, but we well, buy them. There was one other book that you wanted to share that you showed me. Oh, and yeah, I yeah. There's, out, a, there's yes. a couple of other books. Well, yeah. there's like... Zami, yeah. there's Zora Neale Hurston, their yes. eyes are watching God. Yes. There's the color purple, which is yes. like I have like Celie and Shook tattooed on me. Yeah. Um, like Amazing. that was like my first instance of like, like black queer like woman love, you yeah. know, was like yeah, yeah. really seeing the movie. Right. I wasn't old enough to read this until I was 16 or something, yeah. but like seeing Whoopi Goldberg and that other sister. I mean, even you like right now with the color purple, like it totally this is, was like. This was for your book. So I'm wearing oh, it for those. <laughs> so I for people that. who are listening to the podcast in audio and not on YouTube on video, um, Janata is the author of a book called The Stars and the Blackness Between Them. And I'm showing the cover of her book right now on video. And it's this beautiful black, purple, sort of deep blues, sort of indigo colors. And I was like, I need to, I need to match this mm. color story for this interview. So I'm wearing purple. I love purple. that so much. <laughs> but, um, oh my gosh, you're such a is, goddess. I'm so grateful. I, I love you. And now this is the moment where I'm going to tell you why it was that I was particularly excited to speak with you. So mm -hmm. first of all, we, we met in a really serendipitous way. Um, you mentioned Toni Morrison and the day that I got introduced to you and your work, I had actually just been for the very first time ever to an event that the free black women's library was doing. And it was a Toni Morrison event. It was in honor of Toni Morrison. And it was a discussion about her book, Sula, which I had finished a few months before. I loved Sula. And so it was the first time for me that I had ever been in a space where there were, it was largely women, but there were people of different genders there um, discussing this you know, black writer in a, in an old black space. Right. And it was just mm -hmm. black, blackity black. Right. <laughs> and it was just, mm -hmm. it just was the most nourishing and filling and beautiful space to be in. I just felt, I felt all the feels. And so I come mm -hmm. out of that and I'm making my way back to the hotel because later on, I'm going to go meet my friend Latham Thomas who is one of my BFFs, but I had never, we'd never met in person. That was the day we we're supposed to be meeting. Yes. So she sends me a video of you and says, Hey, this is my friend, Janata. She was sharing with me what your book means to her. And I thought you would appreciate hearing this. So she mm -hmm. sends me a clip of you talking about how the white people that you work with, I guess in the theater space. Yes. <laughs> totally <laughs> right had been doing me in white supremacy and, mm -hmm. and you shared what that meant for you and how they were now showing up differently and how it made things easier for you and totally for you. shout out heart of the beast theater because yeah. when i saw they were doing that that wasn't even my idea right they, like literally were reading emergent strategy by my friend adrian marie brown yes and they were reading um your book and when i knew they were reading your book i was like okay i'll work with y'all white folks Right. Because that lets me know that they're actually serious about doing labor to change power dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, especially yes. within these like white led liberal right. nonprofit organizations. Right. It's like a lot of them have created a stratum for themselves to feel right. good about themselves and still position themselves, you know, oh, that part, centered. <laughs> right. that part. Right. So <laughs> when they were doing that, I was like, okay, y'all, I will, I will sign this contract. Let's, yeah. let's do this. Cause it so, lets me know y'all are ready. That means so much to me. And the reason it made me so happy when I saw the video um, of you from Latham was, you know, the beneficiaries of my work are black people and people mm -hmm. of color. And so to get that kind of, 
feedback just it filled me up so much. So I've had Toni Morrison, then I've seen this amazing <laughs> video by this woman, Janata. And then I go and meet Latham at her home and we're meeting for the first time. And, you know, that was very, you know, that was everything. And then I sit down at her at, uh, uh, coffee, like in her living room and on her coffee table are two signed copies of your book. And she's like, do you want one? And I'm like, yes, I do, actually. I always <laughs> love free books. And it's signed. And then later that day, you messaged me, I believe, and said, hey, I'd love to give you a copy of my book. And I'm like, I've, got, I've actually got it. I've already got oh. it. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's signed, it's already signed. So I'm really happy. Um, but that was a very, um, serendipitous, um, beginning to then me opening your book and starting to read it. And I started reading it when I came back home to Qatar. So I, I was in New York, um, for about two weeks where I was uh, doing some pre-publication stuff and I was speaking at Latham's, mm -hmm. um, conference, continuum conference. And then I came back home and started reading your book and I open it up and I start reading it and I'm like, wow and the wow was because I didn't know what to expect I remember you sent me a message and you said I'm going to read what you told me the book was about oh lord you said it's about queer young black love between black girls across the diaspora mass incarceration astrology ancestral magic Whitney Houston and trusting your sacredness despite oppression and heartbreak and so I was like that sounds fascinating. I don't know what I'm like when I open it, what's going to spill out, you know? <laughs> I, don't, I knew it was going to be a beautiful story because the cover itself is beautiful. Um, but Shout I out Charles know. Chazon and Samara Her Irvani. Like they totally, yeah, because writing a book is so many people. It's people yes. like Latham passing it on to people right. like you. It's the people, yeah, yeah. as you, you know. know cause you you're, never you know, know right. Experience. You never know yeah. whose hands it's going to end up in, how it's going to end, end up in their hands which countries it's going to travel to. Yes. Right? So it's, totally. it's, it's complete magic, but I opened it and I started mm. reading it. And, and this is like no BS. I remember the first time I started reading Audre Lorde's work, which was not that long ago. I didn't grow up with these writings with Audre mm. Lorde, with Octavia Butler, with Toni Morrison. It was just a few years ago for me. And I remember the first time I started reading Audre Lorde's work and it was like, I would read it and then have to just sit, like put the book down and just let it sit for a moment. Mm. And one of my favorite poems is a poem by Audre Lorde called A Woman Speaks. And it opens with that line, moon marked and touched by sun. And that for me is such a, it's such a, there's something about it that just does something <laughs> to me inside. But I actually got, I bought a uh. sign. It was here in my home office before. It's tucked away somewhere now, but it has those lines, moon marked and touched by sun. Mm. How those words made me feel, those words by Audre Lorde, is how your writing made me feel. And mm, each I melt, page, I melt, I <laughs> melt. Each page, as I turned it, it was like, I feel the presence of Audre Lorde. I feel the presence of Octavia Butler. I feel the presence of Toni Morrison. I feel the presence of Lucille Clifton. I feel all mm. of these um, black, like you said, black, you know, feminist matriarchs, these yeah. ancestors who were to, to us now are sort of, sort of almost ethereal, but also at the same mm -hmm. time, very real. Like mm. she's my auntie, but also she's an angel. Like, you know, like she's both, a deity. Right. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. Cause yeah, we yeah. are, we yes. are, and they yeah. are, you know, and I right. think it's so tremendous to to remember that because yes. i think our whole existence is to try to erase that truth right you know as obvious as it obviously is right we were taught to think like the worst of who we are and where uh, we're from you yeah. know so so it just mm. it meant so much to me janata because i one of the things that i was so sad about is these women i mean i have them above me right now so i'm in my home office and above me are images of tony morrison audrey lord Maya Angelou and Octavia Butler. Like they look, mm. they're here with me always in these interviews. And one of the things that I was so sad about is because I discovered their work way later into my life. I didn't mm. have years of being able to, it's kind mm. of like, 
it's kind of like the way that I'm really grateful that I'm alive in the time that Beyonce is alive. And I feel kind Talk of about bad it. for the people who are going to know her afterwards, but not know yeah. her in her. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Seeing her in yeah. concert, <laughs> right. being alive. Well, that's kind of how I feel like when my parents talk about when Bob Marley right. put out albums, right. you're like, you know, I know the greatest hits. I know it from like retrospect right. and nostalgia. Right. I don't know it, but not know totally it in the present in the time. moment. So the, yes. gift, the gift that I got with your writing is, no, she's a living, living breathing woman now. She exists mm. now, and this is how mm. she writes, and this is what she's... So I have all the feels for you and your book and your work, and it's exciting because you're... I mean, it feels like you're just getting started. You're not just getting started because, mm. you know, this is your life. But also, it's like, oh, there's so much. I know there's so much more. There's even more that she's going to be able to share and give. And your work mm-hmm. is so fertile and blossoming. And I just want to honor you and say thank you. And I'm so grateful for you um, because in reading your words and the way that you write and the story that you tell, but that you infuse it with ancestry and magic and poetry, there's poems in this book. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this great gift that makes me so grateful to be a black woman. Mm-hmm. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful and I'm letting this go entirely to my core right now. Yeah. You know, I think it's not easy figuring any of this existence out, you know, and I think it really does mean a lot to feel like you're amongst people who are on the same wavelength and frequency about like, how do we really hold space and witness all of our power, all of our magics and activate it so that we could actually heal, you know, and we could actually, and there's so many ways that we have healed and continue to heal, you know? Um, But I I do feel like just grateful, A, to be seen so lovingly by you, you know, um, and my work to be, you know, ensconced amongst people who really did give me permission to literally breathe and continue right, to breathe right. and to look at my and to literally look at myself in the mirror yeah. with love and yeah. with you know sweetness and to be curious about my existence on an existential level not in the ways that I fulfill the um sort of fantasies or expectations of whiteness but what is right. it to actually thrust myself into my existential truth through like sheer curiosity, you know, right. um, and wildness, you know, like I think for me so much of the book, and I mean, it was interesting um, you when you were saying um, about how, you know, you found these people later in life, you know, yeah. like after, you know, either they had passed or, right. um, you know, like not Tony when they were Morrison, like dropping yeah. this. Tony Morrison just passed last year, but the others. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have a Toni Morrison story. I never got to meet her. Mm. Um, but when I lived in New York, um, she had written a lib uh, operetta based off of Margaret, um, I forget what her name is, Margaret Gardner, mm. who Beloved is based off of the like African enslaved woman who, you know, murdered her children. Anyway, yeah. so it was at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, you know, yeah. and I bought me my little nosebleed tickets. I'm like, I'm going to see me a Black opera, Toni Morrison wrote. <laughs> um, and so I'm there in the lobby and like across the lobby is Toni Morrison. And like, the thi- I mean, I was 27, I think at the time. And I remember being like, she's so petite. Like in my mind, like, yeah, she's like maybe five, two, you know, she's not a very tall woman, you know, um, and her like dress were just like so pretty and white and like, and just, she was just surrounded by people and I didn't have no reason to go up to her or nothing, (laughs) but, um, but just being in her, um, another person who I had that experience with Sonia Sanchez, who I actually did go up to and say hi to, um, so Sonia Sanchez is a Libra mm. and I literally was like, hi, like my heart was beaten and shaken. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm about to go say hi to Sonia Sanchez in the middle of the Philadelphia train station. And then she was like, oh, hi, honey. Hold on a second. Let me get my ticket. And then we should talk. And she literally <laughs> sat with me for an hour and a half at oh, the train wow. station. Yeah. Wow. So I feel like, you know, and she was just talking about her garden. She was talking about wow. her children and her, you know, she was just being a person who was right. in a train station, you right. know, um, 
and like those are the moments like when I like when I think about who I want to be and like you know thinking about the sorry there's like three things I'm, I'm talking about so one is like here's these beautiful women and now they're real women they're real people yes, yes like Toni yes. Morrison is like this goddess like surrounded by right, people right at the opera she wrote right but she also is like Sonia Sanchez in that like she has a garden and she has right, family and she right. has like you know grown woman issues right she's she thinking about right um but then I was um thinking about like the book so me writing a YA book you know what mm-hmm. I mean and thinking about like being young women who really like what are the things that young people nowadays can have access to right. to teach them about their witchiness to teach them about their magic right um in ways that like you know i think that i really did absorb from a lot of these folks you know what yeah. i mean and they've written ya books and like i mean i think the bluest eyes of ya book mm. um mm-hmm. you know it's a mm-hmm. it's also a limitless book like why i think like tony morrison taught me that you could write a book that's for and about young people. Yeah. And it talks to the young people and all of our existence. Like all of us yes. can relate. Well, yeah. I mean, stories. I read, and let's talk about your book. So I, yes, I'm reading The Stars and the Blackness between them. And I'm not reading it. I mean, I, it was only when I saw it described as a young adult book that I was like, oh, yeah, it's a young adult book. But I was, <laughs> <laughs> but I was just reading it as a book. You know, I wasn't thinking of it, oh, it's for younger people. It was it's I'm getting so much from it and I think you're right it's Mm -hmm. the young person in me um that is getting so much from it um tell us about this book um yeah what what is the premise for people who haven't read it yeah so it's a book um that follows two girls primarily one named Mabel who's um sort of a tomboy queer girl in Minneapolis um And um, she lives with her sort of like free spirited, like conscious black parents. Um, And they're a tight knit family and a little brother and a cat named Andre 3000. And um, she um, befriends this girl, Audrey, who is somewhat like exiled to Minneapolis to live with her black American father. And um, Audrey's from Trinidad. Um, and she got discovered, like, making out with a girl from her church, and, like, her mom, you know, sent her to go live with her dad, and these girls come into each other's life at this critical moment in which um, Mabel, the girl in Minneapolis, um, discovers that she's, you know, has a serious illness. Mm -hmm. Um, So the book is then brings us into the realms of... um, this other character, Afua, who's um, an astrologer and a man on death row, um, who, you know, writes very lusciously about Black existentiality in a way. Yeah. Um, and in Mabel's sort of uncertain future, she really sort of identifies with the stories within his book. Um, and meanwhile, the girls are also like falling in love mm. and Audrey is really doing her best to try to heal her friend. Mm. Um, and she also has Audrey, um, best friend is her grandmother, Queenie, right. who's sort of like the I love iconic, Queenie. sexy. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love <laughs> Queenie. Oh my gosh. I want to be Queenie talking about what kind of ancestor I want to yeah. be, you know, an elder. Yeah. So I feel like the book really goes into multiple spaces, places, and time, a lot of emotions, a lot of feelings. And um, yeah, like I really wanted to process Black healing and limitlessness within a very violent earthly existence, you know, Um, which everybody navigates in their own way. There's so many there's so many themes that you pull out in the book um, that are just very meaningful to me. so first of all, you are Trinidadian and from Minneapolis, right? And have a yeah. Caribbean background, right? Yeah, my father's Crucian from the Virgin mm-hmm. Islands. So it's like my mother's Trini, my dad's Crucian. And yes, mm-hmm. I'm born in the States though. Yeah, yeah. And so these, um, so the place that you're writing from, especially when you're talking about um, Audrey, like it's really interesting because for me, I think, I can remember years ago when I was in school, my mom had a friend who was from Trinidad and and Tobago and we just loved them because we were just like, we love the way you talk and the way you are (laughs) and everything about you. Um, But also at the time, there were not many black people here in in Qatar that we knew. Um, So Mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, because her daughter was at um, a school that was next to our school and we were friends. 
Um, but Ooh, I did Trinis really, in Qatar. Yes. I can't wait till the Trinis find out. <laughs> I mean, we out here. You're everywhere. <laughs> but I didn't get to really um, learn about the culture in depth until I was reading reading this book. And it's so interesting the ways that Black cultures across the diaspora are so diverse, but also have so much in common. <laughs> that part. That is one of my theses of Negro nigganessness. Right. No matter where we go. No matter where we're from. Where, whether I've been in Brazil. Right. Whether I've been in Cuba, whether I've been in Cameroon. Right. We like to be on the block. Right. We like to have fun. We like right. to laugh. We like to, you know what I mean? There's a yes. juiciness, and there's, you know, to us. There's always this energy as well of the, of the, of the, of the matriarch, the woman mm-hmm. of the family, the woman ancestors. And so reading about Queenie, even though my grandmothers were not like Queenie, but I mm-hmm. felt so much connection and remembrance of my grandmothers in mm-hmm. reading the book. My mother is, you know, we're Muslim, um, but my mother is very witchy. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. You know, and I'm just like, it's the African. <laughs> That's what it mm-hmm. is. It's the, it's the African, you know, with the herbs and the prayers and this and that. And I'm reading your book and the things that Queenie, the grandmother, is teaching Audrey, the granddaughter. Things which was interesting, actually, because Queen, um, Audrey's mother didn't inherit that. Mm-hmm. And had gone more in the direction of the church and Christianity. Whereas there's this bond between the grandmother and the granddaughter that feels very steeped in, in African and black culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was, what was the, um, why was that important for you to, to, to bring out? Like it's such, it feels like it's such a core theme of the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think like so much of my curiosity of life, you know, from a young age mm. was, Like I felt in alignment with like a switchy energy, you know what I mean? Like my family, even though like my grandmother's super religious, um, she just passed, she's an ancestor now and she was super Mm. witchy though. Mm. Like, I think no matter, like our, our religiosity has never canceled out our witchy sort of like ancestral practices of spirit, spirituality. And I think so part of my study in um, college was going to Brazil to study abroad and I was very curious, like, to just see, like, how did Africanness sort of thrive and exist in all of these places, you know? Yeah. Um, so, like, I went to Brazil, and they very much practice um, a religion there that is inspired and steeped and aligned with mm. African spirituality, um, Candomblé, which is, like, voodoo or Santeria, yes. um, or even, like, I would say the Black church in the United States, you know? Like, I think there's so many ways that we are inhabitants of spirit and ancestral conversations within our body. Like, we don't even need to articulate it. That's with, it, right. In the words, you right. know? Um, so like for me going to Brazil and being like, oh, this person, like that Negro, I know from off the block, that person over there is like my auntie and I'm in a whole other country. Right. And I think for me, like that was this moment where I was like, dang, like one thing these white people really wanted me to understand in all of my upbringing was that something about my Africanist was broken and destroyed because of their enslavement of my ancestors. Right. My ancestors didn't know how to literally bring into the seeds of their like marrow and cells, their spirit and connection to spirit. You know what I'm saying? Like to me, it was just like, yo, like, but to actually, like, I remember the first night I was in Brazil and um, I was walking down the street and I heard samba music. Like there was like some house party and people were playing guitars and triangles and drums. And literally like my heart, like I couldn't sleep. Like my mm-hmm. heart like was just hearing the ants, like being on ancestral land where my ants, like, so anyways, like so much of the book is like, how do I convey these things? You know, how do mm-hmm. I convey the multiple ways we deal with it? Like I think Audrey's mom in a lot of ways, like struggles with like, how do you live in any particular colonized culture and survive as a woman? Like there's so many ways that we navigate that. I think there is an aspect of queerness though, that like Queenie has and Audrey has that really allows a certain kind of portal away from some of these things. Um, But to me, I did want to contend with what I know is the reality of a lot of black people throughout the diaspora is that we really do struggle with how to navigate queerness, you know? Mm. Um, 
and there's ways that the girls in all of the you know parts of the book you know are navigating like how do i live my full wild you know sort of divine self right in ways that like really is me embodying it from a a knowledge that i don't know but i remember yes so, yeah mm-hmm. yeah and that's i think again that's one of the reasons why in reading your book and and reading how Audrey and, and uh, Mabel uh, navigate um, how they feel, right? And how, mm-hmm. how their families feel about how they feel or how they have to hide how they feel from their families. Um, it just reminds me of reading Zami by Audrey mm-hmm. Lord and her having to navigate her relationship with her mother, who is from Grenada, and mm-hmm. having to kind of really hide her queerness, right? And feeling mm-hmm. that disconnect. Um, and there was an interview that you did. I watched, um, I can't remember who it was with, but you said Mm -hmm. something really important in there, which is you said, you know, this book is part of it is, is for, is for young people to know, especially um, uh, young queer people and young queer black people to know, you know, there is a space for you to be here, but also we've always been here. Mm -hmm. This isn't new. You know, this Mm -hmm. isn't something, a novelty that's just happening right now being queer. It, it, queer people have existed throughout history, um, throughout mm-hmm. time, from the very beginning. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I just, I, I, as someone who isn't queer, you know, and has, you know, straight privilege and all of that, but there's just something so important for, for me and I think for all of us to have these stories because you do allow us to open that door and to see the world in other ways that straightness or being in the gender binary doesn't allow us to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like I think that to me is something I truly, truly feel grateful to have access to like any story about like, you know, black folks being, and I don't know, like, cause queer is just like the term we have. Like, I think there's like so many ways that ourselves right even you know like just like so it's kind of like an umbrella term so I feel like yeah like there there's all of these ways that a you know this has existed through time and place but also that um like I think like the relationships with the girls even before there was anything romantic or even with girls that weren't in a romantic bond there's this like sort of queer love that like young friendship sort of really mirrors you know like I think that as a young person, I was obsessed with my friends. I was obsessed with how they felt. And maybe that's just my kind of emotional personality. But like, you know, there was like these ways that the ways I related to them had a romanticism that wasn't sexual, but was certainly deep and really. So I think like, that's the thing of like, how do we give humanity permission to be in relationship with each other in ways that isn't mitigated on these very specific spectrums of like oh this is romantic this is queer this is whatever right because I think like I mean I even I mean there's not a lot of there's not a lot of boys in this book but I think particularly for boys boys of color non-binary you know trans bodied people who don't feel permission to live Mm. in this world like a lot of that is a psychosis that was put onto us by white supremacy right like a lot of that was a violence put onto us when they came into our ancestral spaces and where our cultures were thriving and or or not necessarily thriving or just being what they were like there was a lot of ways that we existed that wasn't around punishing things that weren't um, cis or hetero or what have you. Right. Um, so I, so certainly in my work, I'm like, yeah, like how do I heal that in a lot of ways for me, but you know, sort of pay it forward in the context of the writing. And this is what I love about, I mean, I don't know, would you describe your work as, and your kind of way of seeing the world as Afrofuturism? Is that a a term that you feel affinity to? I've been, um, I use the term black diaspora futurism, Okay. Um, which is a little and more what's wordy. The distinction? What's the distinction for you? Well, I think for me is that like, um, when I think of all of that's created me, like I, I do acknowledge the diaspora. I do acknowledge being raised in Minnesota on Dakota land, indigenous mm. Dakota land, and the ways that like the drum within these spaces of Anishinaabe and Dakota ancestors. Like I learned the drum for the first time and that connected me to my African ancestors, Mm. you know, like, and my existence of being a Caribbean person migrated 
into, you know, so for me, like Afrofuturism was a term coined by a white guy, which, you know, is neither here nor there, but it's there. Um, (laughs) And um, I think for me, like, I'm really, when I think about the futurism, like it is very inclusive of uh, acknowledgement that we are on the continent and we're also dispersed through the planet and have been for, I mean, even before, like, right. you know, the slave trade. Right. You know? Yes, um, yes, yeah. So it's like, I'm the only one who I know who uses that term. Like, I just came up with this. Especially once I heard it was written by Black guy. I was like, you know what? I was never too, like, you know, the Afro. <laughs> whenever Afro is in front of anything, I'm like, who wrote this? Um, <laughs> I need to Afro-American, know. American. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nobody out here Afro-American. Afro-futurism. Uh-huh. But I also would say I'm an Afro-futurist in the sense that, like, you know, there's a uh, thought and collection and experience of being in the world that is classified as Afrofuturist that I totally right. feel like strongly in love and in the lineage of. So, right, right. Well, so, complicated writerly well, answer. I, and we are writers, so that's where we're going to go. But it's, <laughs> it's interesting because I, I went to see, oh, what movie was it? I went to see a movie with my husband and it was with Brad Pitt and it was a movie where he had to go into space to get his father Oh my gosh, I wanted movie. to see that movie. Was it good? It is a good movie, but the whole time. Yeah. So because of the work that I do, I'm always watching things through two lenses. So <laughs> I know that feeling, baby. I know that feeling. I just like, I wish I could just sit and yeah, enjoy it. But I, I wish I could lens, enjoy okay? it. But I'm sitting there and I'm like, so I guess black people just won't go into space then. So we just, <laughs> we, just we won't be there in the future. We don't go into space. We don't exist in space, mm. right? So that's the... So Mm -hmm. when I think about, you know, Afrofuturism or Black diaspora um, uh, futurism, I think about how it brings, it's not, it's not, it's based in indigeneity and the past and in ancestry. Mm -hmm. It it says that we can't go to where we want to go without taking where we've come from. Sankofa Starship, baby. Sankofa right, Starship. Right. <laughs> For real. Right. I totally with you on that. Yeah. And and that to me is just, there's something so grounded in it. There's something so mm-hmm. um, uh, consist, consistent mm. about Blackness and um, and being Indigenous, being mm-hmm. person of color in the same way that whiteness doesn't afford the same thing. I'm not saying white people don't have roots. I'm saying white supremacy erases that and says you are now white instead of belonging to the culture that you belong to and and what you inherit with that is a history of colonization and enslavement and and land theft and murders and killings and rapings and all of these things Mm -hmm. um what to we, the world and to yourselves to the world like y'all start y'all did that to y'all selves right right and then brought that on right and for us and when you said about i had to learn that whiteness is trying to teach me that there was something broken about me, that being black mm-hmm. meant that I was broken. For me, Afrofuturism and what I see in this book, so linking it back to your book with mm-hmm. Queenie, the grandmother who's teaching Audrey, the next generation as she's growing up is you can't go there without these tools. You need to know these mm-hmm. things. You need to know how to tune into yourself. You need to know how to listen. You need to know how to trust your dreams. You need to know how to work with these elements that is what will help you as you move into the future. These things won't tie you to the past and keep you stuck here. They will be the foundation from which you grow your own future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I love the way you told you that was so eloquent, Layla, because that really is it. Like, I think we were taught to feel ashamed of being of, I mean, I'll speak from being born in the States and my right. experience, like, anything African was considered like the worst, right? You know, it was like the dirtiest, the poorest, the nastiest. Like mm. we used to say, Oh man, you get them African booty scratchers off me. Like, you know, we would just say ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't even think I would say that shit, but that was, you know, that was the, the, the That's tone. That and my mom internalized the internalized oppression, right? Totally. And yeah. it was like all, you know, kids of all races too, in addition right. to black kids for sure. Yeah. And like my mom is interesting because like my mom is like totally like, you know, super like ebony dark skin, always had her hair shaved mm-hmm. in a fade on some Grace Jones shit. Mm-hmm. And like she really was like, you know, this Trinidadian woman who was raised to just think she's she's a Torian too. Okay. So my mom is just like 
the queen of I'm cute. I don't know what anybody probably, everybody's attracted. It's just true. She's cute. And she's queenie. Like in a lot of ways, queenie is inspired by my mom, by Alexis Duvaux, like these black women who are just so clear about their regality Mm. and about their, you know, deification. I've seen pictures of your mom and clear Um, about her regality is, it sums her up. Yes. Totally. That is an energy that she emanates is regality. And there's no yeah. questioning. It's not a question. Am I, do I have permission to, am I allowed? No, no, no. <laughs> she is no, who she no, is. No, no. <laughs> Deal with it or. <laughs> yeah, or keep yeah. it moving. Yeah. Which I think is like literally um, the sort of guidance I needed with my sensitive spirit. Mm-hmm. I was not raised in the Caribbean like my parents surrounded in blackness. Like mm-hmm. I was raised in Minneapolis, which is diverse, but also very much like a white supremacist kind of liberal I was, city I was, and state. I was there last year. It's it's very white. <laughs> OMG. I would have took you, picked you up and took you around somewhere, brought you some but lonely I was, people. I was there for a conference by one of my friends, Catrice Jackson, and the conference was called Follow Black Women. And it was a mm. an apologetically Black women-led conference. So oh, gee, was where good. was yeah. I? Yeah, it was good. Where it was, was I? <laughs> and I need to know your friend, Catrice. I don't know if I know them. Um, but yeah, so I just think like for me, I'm glad that I had my mom mm-hmm. being that because even though like I ended up really having a lot of self-hatred and like, you know, dislike for my appearance and things like that, just growing up in the 80s and Minnesota does have like an aspect of not only white supremacy but certainly like light skin privilege you know what Mm. i mean like there's a lot of mixed people here Mm -hmm. there's a lot of interracial relationships and people aren't processing race they're just making families and making babies and still sort of inheriting and like internalizing a lot of these sort of um ideas around whiteness and you know that being better right so i think for me like yeah just like so much of what i'm still processing in my creativity and within my own womanhood is like, yeah, like I, but I don't, I I feel like I'm less processing it. Like I'm almost 40. Like I really feel like, yo, I'm a bad bitch. I'm fly. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm cute in the face and in the waist. Um, You know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm totally like have released a lot of those hangups, but so much of my life was in that heart space, you know? Right. How did so, you yeah. how did your healing happen? What what were some of the elements that allowed you to get into that space of uh, I'm that bitch? Like what was what were some of the things that have been yeah, mm. important to you? It sounds like your mom was a huge influence. Yeah, but yeah. I feel like my mom like as a kid like me and her we did, I grew up in the grunge alternative like TLC baggy pants and my mom is like this West Indian woman of like Liz Clay, you know what I mean? That was her vibe, Dayton's and stuff. Um, So I think for me, like a lot of that presentation of feminists felt very unsafe growing Mm -hmm. up, you know, in the hood, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we were in a neighborhood where a lot of like sex trafficking and stuff happened. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my sense of my beauty was a thing that was hidden. Um, And I really feel like lately I've, I think partly coming out, you know, like coming out, like I came out in my thirties, you know, like mm. I was 31, um, becoming an artist, I think was some of the ways, like I kind of retrieved myself, you yeah. know, and because you talk this- about, you talk about wildness and that's something that I feel as I was re- reading your book was, yeah, she's a wild woman. She's a, she is, um, free. There's, there is a mm. lot of freedom in this book and, and, I feel free as I, as I read your words. Oh, I love that, Layla. Yeah, freedom is very important to me. I think like there's so much. Yeah, I feel like for whatever reason in this time of being Black, like that is the thing that we have to, that is our hero's journey, you yeah. know, in a lot yeah. of ways, you know, both on a psychological and physical level yes, um, and a soul level and sensual and sexual level, you know, like I mm-hmm. think there's a lot of ways that this book and, you know, um, is sort of like healing what I hope is offering a healing for people to totally live in the freedom of themselves, you know, mm-hmm. in ways that our colonization and our enslavement 
wanted to take away our sensuality right. from us, you right. know, it want, right. or wanted to negative, negative, negativize or stigmatize it yeah. and be like, oh, you a hoochie and you a hoe. And it's like, well, what if I'm a hoochie and I'm a hoe? Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. what are these things that y'all want to stigmatize? What if, what if, you know, y'all don't understand us. So why are you standardizing us? And you what's know? so interesting to me about that is when when white women get access to that freedom for themselves, right? That's, mm-hmm. those are not the names that they are labeled with. Mm-hmm. Um, Hoochie, Ho, those are not the names that they are called, but it, it is for black women. Mm-hmm. And then you then have, I just, I'm, <laughs> I'm one of the older people that have just joined TikTok because we're in quarantine. We're in quarantine, and I'm like, <laughs> listen, I need some TikTok entertainment. Got a lot of us millennials <laughs> and older behind this quarantine. Okay. You're welcome, TikTok. So I'm like, I'm because <laughs> I'm not posting anything. I'm just there for the just for the laughs, just to see it. Um, but you, but you, but the reason I'm bringing in TikTok is, you know, I joined it, and my one of my uh, best friends, um, who's a black woman, said to me. Just be aware, because she joined just just before I did. Just be aware there is a lot of digital blackface that happens on this app. There is a lot of mm-hmm. um, uh, white people um, who take, uh, you know, uh, clips from black people and replicate them, taking dances and challenges and things from black people and replicating them. So, so bringing this back to, we get called these derogatory names, right? Derogatory names, but then they're appropriated afterwards and then they're seen as entertainment. They're seen as cool, urban, edgy, Mm -hmm. you know, all of those coded words. But when we reclaim our wildness, it's, it's a bad thing. And it seems to me that Mm -hmm. black people Black people across the diaspora have had the word wild weaponized against us. And what Mm -hmm. that has done is meant that we are afraid to access it, but actually when we access it is where we get our power back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think like that's been almost my, you know, sort of compass for finding where my power is, is to see what has been stigmatized about me. You know what I mean? What has been stigmatized about my blackness and my queerness or what have you, you know, about my existence. Right. Like the fact that, you know, yeah, the fact that we did not want to spend our whole day sitting up in some space working for white people. That's also, you know what I mean? Like, because we want to be free. We want to hang out on, you know, amongst our community and laugh and do things communally. Like these are all things that have been stigmatized in all kinds of ways, but those were our powers. Our powers were our togetherness um, and our collectivity. Our power was in our, I mean, that's what I love about um, this book with Sadia Hartman is she talked about like all of these black blues women who at the time, at the end of slavery, like that, you know, our whole bodies, our whole sexuality Mm. was owned by our white men, by these white people. You know what I mean? They chose who and when we had babies, if we got to even raise our children. So all of a sudden at the end of this, you know, time and like eras and eras and generations of this here, all of a sudden you have these black women who are like, yeah, I want to have my little apartment and have my little boyfriend come in and fuck me when I want to be fucked. Right. And, right. or I want to have kids with these, you know, these are the people I want to have kids with. Right. You know what I'm saying? And like, all of that is like, oh, well, you didn't get married and have a kid with this person. And it's like, and that's the thing people can do too. Yeah. But I think like specifically in the blues music, like these black women were like, you know, my man done left me. So I got me another man or whatever right. the things we right. would sing about. Right. Right. Like right. white femininity didn't create a space for that. Like it was very chaste. It was very like whatever. So black women really did like were pioneers and innovators and sort of like understanding like the immensity of a sexual romantic relationship life that also too is probably ancestral. You know what I mean? There's ways that we got to live in agency Mm -hmm. or, you know, we forced an agency around our bodies and things like that um, as a response. And that became criminalized because that was in direct you know, um, sort of, um, what's the word defiance of how white people is like, they, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like for me, so much of these feelings is just like, you know, like you said, like I'm, I'm just beginning in a lot of ways, but I still feel so overwhelmed with like, 
of the stories and just like, how do we, t- I just want to talk about these things because yeah. so much of my life we didn't get to, you know? Right. Right. It's like, Oh, don't, don't be, don't be a baby mama. Don't be a this, don't be a that. Right. That's why I love Erica Badu. Erica Badu is like, I will be the baby mama. Right. Okay? I don't care. Right. My kids are beautiful. We eat mangoes and juice and watermelon and burning right. incense and free, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know we've talked about Audrey Lord a lot in this um, oh, conversation, but I can, I can, I can, I can uh, exactly. I can talk about her all day long. Um, <laughs> but, but what's just come to mind is, is uh, one of my favorite um, uh, things that she's ever written, which is um, nothing that I accept about myself can be used against me to diminish me. Mm. Bars. So, right. Bars. <laughs> she had bars, right? <laughs> Aquarian and- <laughs> man, Aquarian. <laughs> Tony Morrison, Audre Lord, Alice yeah. Walker, that Angela Davis, all yeah. of those Aquarian Black feminists thought like right, Lord, right, Bart. And I remember a, a story that she wrote about. I can't remember which book it was in, and she was talking about how she was going to go teach at this uh, uh, college, um, and one of the things that she was afraid of people weaponizing against her was her was her queerness. And so mm. she wrote like a, she wrote something on a piece of paper, just letting them know, yes, I am a lesbian, you know, and put it on her door so that when they came in, they would read it. So I've told you now, you can't use it against me. I own it. I'm letting you know in advance. And mm. it's like what you said about Erica Badu saying, yeah, I, I am. I am that. I am that thing that you're saying I should not be claiming. And what? Mm-hmm. And that. And what? And what? And, what? and, and self and def- s- yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think, well, I know from my, from my own self, from my own journey in healing as a Black woman, self-definition, the responsibility and the, um, uh, the responsibility, the right and the privilege to define mm-hmm. ourselves for ourselves is so powerful. And mm-hmm. when we think about the different ways that white supremacy um, tries to tell us who we are, has told us throughout our entire lives, before we were even here, told our ancestors who we were, the mm-hmm. act of self-definition and living into freedom in the ways that we choose for ourselves is so amazing. So my, so my mentor, Dr. Frantonia Pollins, always says to me, my self-love as a black woman isn't an act of revolution because that would be to say that whiteness has the standard of what's allowed and my love for myself is the source of it comes from being in opposition to whiteness mm-hmm. right my mm-hmm. my self-love is my self-love i love myself because i love myself not because i'm re- revolting against white supremacy and coming back to that space is I think it's so powerful. I mean, I get, I do get the power of claiming self-love as revolution because it is revolutionary to love yourself in a world in a society that tells you you're inferior, you're nothing, mm-hmm. no matter what you do, you'll never be good enough. We will incarcerate you. We will punish you. We all of these things. It is revolutionary mm-hmm. to love yourself, and yet the source of my self-love will not be in opposition to what you say about me. Mm-mm. Yeah, no. I mean that totally makes me think of Alexis Duval, who mm. is such a brilliant goddess, and her talking about like, yeah, like my blackness is just like so in the future. Like I'm just right. not even studying. Right, right. So these I, people, I knew you said you said her name a couple of times. I'm like, I do oh, know yeah. that name. I do know that name, and I looked over. Bow. There we go. <laughs> Alexis Duval is the. Um, uh, author of Warrior Poet, a biography of Audre Lorde. This is one of my favorite books. Yeah, Alexis Duvall is, so she's like my mentor slash mama slash. I'm, I'm fangirling mama. really hard right now because this is one of my favorite books in the world. <laughs> Yo, Alexis, yeah, you should follow her on the gram. She's yeah. so adorable and she's totally like this like hot to trot queer 70 something year old, you know, badass hot. Like she teaches me about how sexual and sensual and pleasured I could be. You know what Mm. I mean? Like she really has taught me and so much of what is in the book is shaped around like her permission Mm. to center those aspects of 
myself and those you know elements in these characters you know because yeah like we truly truly gosh we're so blessed we're so blessed by these black women who really did give us uh, I hate to use this term permission, you know what I mean? But like in a lot of ways, but it's it like they, it. a foundation. It, 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 yeah, yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Because I have to give, you know, my friends, my daughter, people, you know, that security to be like, yes, be yourself. Like yes. all this other noise. Nah, nah, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. What are some of the things that you're excited about now that this, this first book is out? What are you excited about working on next? Well, um, I'm in the process and excited and praying and hoping to get this adapted to a film. um, (gasps) Oh, yes. I really want to watch it. Yes. (laughs) I know me too. I think it'll be dope. And initially when I had the idea for the book, it was a film idea. Mm. So like that coming together and it's to me, it's, it is, it's coming together in a way in a beautiful divine way and I trust it I truly trust I am so I'm I'm so excited for when it's going to be here I know it's going to be amazing there's one element actually that is in the book that we didn't talk about and I realized Mm -hmm. that when you stood up just now you have a um Whitney Houston I think pillow oh yeah Houston OMG if I would have forgot Whitney she would have got really mad she's a Leo we gotta talk about Whitney Houston because she is referenced throughout this book Mm-hmm. Uh, why and what does she mean to you yeah so Whitney Houston of course is like black girl icon number one you know what I mean like thinking about being in alive in the time of Beyonce like yeah. I think Beyonce's ancestor and her marrow is you know certainly Whitney Houston is certainly one of them you know like just getting to be sort of this you know I don't know divine sort of soulful being yeah. as an artist Um, but I feel like one thing that sort of came to me in the, so initially when I was writing this book, I was just like, I'm writing this book about these girls. And then Whitney Houston just kept on arriving. Like I was at a friend's house in Atlanta. There was a coffee table book that was a Whitney book. Cause you know, this was a lesbian woman. She was like, Oh, Whitney's my bae. (laughs) And then, um, me and my wife were in Amsterdam. We, you know, on the lurk for a gay club, we find a gay club. There's like this framed picture of Whitney Houston. The next day we're at a museum in Amsterdam. There's like a painting of Whitney Houston. Then we go to the grocery store, Whitney's playing. Like, so to me, it's like, I listen to the ancestors. And can I just tell you, I just remembered something that happened today, actually. I was in the dining room with my kids. They're doing like um, study from home. And Maya, who's my 10 year old daughter, starts uh, humming a song and I listen and she's singing, um, I will always love you. Mm. And, and I said to her, I didn't know you knew who Whitney Houston was. And she goes, who's Whitney Houston? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> And I'm like, she's only one of the greatest singers of all time. You know her song without even knowing who she is. <laughs> so she, oh, she must gee, have known that's that Whitney. I was, that's Whitney. She knew I was going to be talking to you today. So she, she just dropped it. Yes. yes. But ancestors talk through children. Like uh-huh. they are like, children are just like in total movement and yeah. conversation with ancestors for yeah. sure. No, totally. Like Whitney. So anyways, like there'd been some movies that had, not movies, documentaries that had coming out in articles, like when she passed about her right. best friend, um, Robin, yeah. um, who, you know, was also her like child, like, you know, teen sweetheart who then became like her main confidant and had her back, um, through a majority of her career until yeah. they fell out, you know, um, mm. in like 99. So yeah, so for me, it was kind of this experience of like, wow, like, you know, just listening to Whitney's presence in my life. So anyways, in writing the book, I just was starting to really think about Whitney's queerness in particular, thinking mm. about sort of like, you know, this relationship with Robin and like this, you know, intent like intensity and beauty and um sort of like genuine friendship and support you know like this connection um and also the ways that that sort of was thwarted in the light of becoming like this huge super pop star icon that has never ever existed before that right right like in the 80s is when like michael jackson and madonna and like just these huge pop stars and it's like 
Whitney was one of them. Yeah. And like queerness was not a part of the equation. And no. so anyways, um, but it also at that time reminded me when I moved to New York, I moved to New York in 2006. And there was this um, older black woman who I used to kick it with. Cause you know, I'm always kicking it with people. Like, especially if you're older than me, we kicking it. Um, and she was like in her forties and I was like in my twenties and we would just chill. And somehow we started talking about Whitney Houston. She's like, oh yeah, Whitney Houston's bisexual. And I remember I was thinking like, Whitney Houston's bisexual? Like that, like, this yeah. is when like the big, like during the, like, you know, Bobby and Whitney, like television. Right. And, and I mean, just thinking back on her career, all her mm -hmm. songs, the way that her whole image was curated. I mean, I remember, I remember hearing that she was bisexual and just wouldn't compute in my brain because of how, mm -hmm. you know, she had been marketed and what was the image that was presented. Totally. Right. Totally. And I yeah. think that's sort of the thing is that that was the machine of pop, right. like, you know, music, you know, is that they try to find a distilled narrative that's two dimensional. Right. And like, that was sort of like the mark she had to bear. And also, you know, she was from a very religious family, but also right. a family of entertainers, you know? Mm. So I think there's like a way that, you know, the more and more I've read and you know studied Whitney Houston um and this is even before like I don't know if recent if you know but recently Robin Crawford um you know her you know homegirl slash girlfriend put out um a memoir yes you yeah, know, talking. yeah I have it somewhere Oop, like a song for you yes um, and I remember it was around the time I heard about that book was around the time I heard about your book so I was like oh that's so cool yeah yeah, so I feel like yeah. that's kind of how like ancestors work sometimes. Yeah. It's like I feel like there was a time where like everybody really started to think about Octavia Butler, yes, as a brilliant mm -hmm. literary force, yeah. but as like a person speaking to, to the a time, time and almost right. like a philosopher, you right. know. And I think, um, and there's ways that we remember people differently, you know, yeah. um, as an ancestor. And I think right now, like Whitney is now not just being like this beautiful sort of spiritual, you know, like unbelievable vocal goddess slash you know person that experienced you know troubles with addiction and mental health and whatnot yeah um but that we're thinking about like her as a more multi-dimensional being like right. what is it to imagine her and that was kind of like my interest in writing the book when she came on into my psyche around it it was like you know um she has this ability to um you know be full to be a person with the sexuality with the silliness like right. in reading robin's book there was a lot of stuff around her being a um you know just kind of like the silly wild mischievous one right. you know like she right. was the one that like robin was the one who had to calm her down you know right and right. chill her out which is what this this um El the sister in new york told me she was like yeah whitney houston is a wild child right. she's like robin would always be the one to calm her down and i was just like like, so all of these, like, sort of abilities to not see these figures as, like, these sterile beings. Like, right. even Beyonce. Like, I think yes. lately Beyonce's had to contend with, like, yeah, I'm an actual human being right. that has feelings and children issues and things, yes. you know? Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting you say about Beyonce. I was just joking to my husband, who doesn't use social media very much, um, doesn't, has never posted anything online in his life ever. Um, and I said, it's so interesting because we're in the time of this global pandemic right now. And she had Beyonce hadn't posted anything online for ages. And I'm like, babe, like people are just waiting on Beyonce to post something like that's so much pressure to put on somebody. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I think if she posts something there, it's going to solve everything. It's going to make them feel better in some way, you know, and she gets to have her own experience of this. Just like every single one of us is trying to navigate mm -hmm. this. Um, there's something about being in the public eye that is dehumanizing um mm -hmm. it makes you this flat 2d person that people paint their projections onto you and then when we're talking about identities and um, ways of being that have been historically and and in modern day time marginalized it's like you don't get to be that you get to be what we say you are you don't get when Houston, you don't get to be bisexual you don't get to be silly fun you you have to be this icon this pop star this thing that we say you are and it's so um i think when i for me when i heard about robin's book and and hearing about whitney in all of these different ways that we hadn't known her 
I felt sad that she didn't get to have that when she was here. But I also feel grateful that we get to see that part that she, that in some way she didn't, her legacy doesn't end up being this 2D vision of who she is, that we get to see more of her as this 3D person Mm -hmm. um, from different people's perspectives. And going back to that thing around like self-definition, the responsibility, the right, and the privilege to be able to say, this is who I am, regardless of where I am is, is just amazing. You know, we don't, we don't Mm -hmm. all get to do that. You know, we don't know how to do that. We're often not taught how to do that. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Like, I think, you know, there's this aspect of, um, sort of like, I mean, it's black respectability, you know, yeah, this idea that, things. and you know, this strong, like there's all of these ideas. And I think like what I love about, you know, figures like Audrey Lord and, and juxtaposition, like to the queerness of, you know, Whitney Houston, you know, yeah. like, like where Audrey Lord got to be like, listen, I'm so myself. I'm so myself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that you, you can't even destroy my imagination about myself. Right, you know? right. And that's like a black queer experience. And then yeah. you have Whitney Houston, who the world got to experience her in all these ways. And she, like, I think of her in the lineage of, you know, Bessie Smith and like all of these like sort of black queer, like soul women, you know, yeah. like women who like sang from the soul that like you hearing that and, and just your goosebumps, all of that stuff, you know, like yeah. that to me, it's like, I, and, 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 and even in writing this book, like, I really was like, yo, I want to think about Whitney in this lineage of like black queer blues women, mm. because she sang our blues and she sang it in a way that, you know, is like resplendent and like that gospel way that like is so black too. like yeah. we suffering and the way we would sing, you would think like, yeah, I mean, we, we, we hold all of it in the right. song, you know? So like, even though they put her in the pop machine, yeah. like she still was bringing that gospel and that soul and that queerness, you know? So yeah. I think for me, I, I do imagine what would it have been like to be a black girl growing up in the eighties? And, you know, she was all of those things and she could have been all of the things that she really right. was. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yes. It's like, she was amazing. And what more? And how, how, you know, going back to that, that idea of permission, how many more people would have had permission to show up in themselves because she was, she had the freedom and the safety to show up as fully her, herself. Well, and it's interesting. Cause we're also like in the times of like Janelle Monet and like, I'm trying to think of like, you know, other sort of, yeah. like queer, like Frank Ocean and, you know, things like that, who, yeah, yeah like they get to include that part of themselves, you know, yeah. um, Sid from the internet, mm. you know, like when the internet came out and here you have like this non-binary, um, like black queer bodied, you know, spirit, like mm. being this sexy rock star and things like that and writing songs to girls and things. Like, I think that's, you know, in thinking of like, you know, this ancestral path, like I just also look at these young people who are like these returned ancestors who are like, yeah. Listen, like I'm going to be, you know, like when I look, seen Janelle Monae, like I remember when Janelle Monae first came out yeah. and not came out as queer, but just, you know, came out yeah. as an artist and she yeah. had her little suits and she's like doing Prince and James Brown. And she's like right. all of these beings and this like body and she's girl and she's also not you know, concerned with the male gaze and wanting, you know what I mean? And not saying that women who are femme do that either, but right. it was just such a like, you know, shift. Right. Um, Especially on I, a main, I, on a main stage on a, in, in, at that level. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, this is like her talent is allowed to be a part of her sexuality and beyond her sexuality and beyond her expression. Like yeah. she gets, she like was asserting this thing, you know, and I, I certainly do feel like, you know, you, f- you feel the Whitney and Janelle, you know, you feel the Whitney and all of these beings. Um, mm. So thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Whitney, thank you, Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and your magic. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh, Whitney. Uh, it's such a beautiful place to, to close up. I really loved this, this conversation. Um, I really want to encourage everyone, beautiful cover again, to get your copy of the stars and the blackness between them. 
I really hope it gets turned into a movie because I truly want to watch it. I think oh, and I'm also working cool. on a second book too. I forgot to mention that. What I've got other projects. Book? Oh yeah. Um, it's a, another young adult novel. Um, it's about like a black girl dealing with, you know, her parents going through a divorce slash mm. existential breakdown and it's in the nineties and she starts training in circus. You wow. know, so, cause I used to be a circus or do performance circus, right. art, like aerial art and stuff like that. So Anyhow, that's like, um, that's like my new like premise that I'm working with. And it's being, it's so fun. It's so beautiful. Oh, um, I can't wait but yes, to read it. all of the things. Yeah, yeah I yes. can't wait to read it. Um, Janata, what, our closing question. Um, mm-hmm. And before I close, I actually, again, I just want to thank you and acknowledge you. Um, this conversation has been so rich and I've really felt it more than in many interviews that I've done. I, I love every interview I do. There's something special and unique and amazing about every single guest that I have here. Um, but I've really loved being in a space where it felt like these names that we've been saying are here present with us, Whitney mm. and Audrey and Zora and Alice and, and Tony and Octavia, that they have been in this conversation with us. And I feel them smiling and them, um, being grateful for the ancestors who came before them and being mm-hmm. proud of the descendants that they see right now as we flower and blossom into ourselves. Um, what a gift, just beautiful. I feel very, very blessed. Mm-hmm. So thank you. Same yeah. here. Same here. I feel like, yeah, like I have been such a huge fan of your work since I met you and I'm like, what? I'm like podcasting with Layla <laughs> and you're reading my book and you're loving yes. my book and sharing yes. my book with the world. So that's beautiful and surreal because I was literally working on this book, you know, when I first became aware of your work. So oh, wow. it's just like, you know, these moments where you're like, that's yeah, like amazing. I had to like literally hold my heart and my chest and my body and just have gratitude for this moment. So thank you for having oh, me on your show and, course. you know, amplify my work. Oh, that makes me so happy. And it goes back to, again, that we never know, like the thing that we're working on in the dark on our own, mm-hmm. you know, well, other people are doing other stuff and we're just committing ourselves to this body of work. Like you never know who's going to be reading it, who's going to be enjoying it, how it's going to be changing people's lives. I posted something yesterday that a year ago today, I was sitting in the library with stacks of books, you know, (laughs) just eyeballs deep in research um, to write what my book is. Uh, is Yeah, there's a copy here. So my book is a very like thin book. It's not a very thick, you know, heavy, big book, but it takes a lot to write a book. (laughs) It takes a lot Mm -hmm. to bring it all in, right? The research, the like channeling within yourself, the connection with, you know, the divine, everything that work which is so sacred that a year later you can be sitting in conversation with somebody who yeah you came into awareness of them when you were writing your book so it is all kinds of magic in there for me so thank you oh my gosh thank you (laughs) all right our closing question um what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor Hmm. um i think living life with as much rootedness and sweetness and curiosity and sensual pleasure as I can. And how do I create a world that supports all of my descendants um, to be fully in that embodiment um, without any sense of emotional, mental, societal restrictions, you know, how do I really lean into the liberation of my descendants, like on a absolutely viscerally, bodily, spiritually, soulfully level, you know, like that for me is what being a good ancestor is. And um, yeah, and also like totally enjoying every morsel of this earthly existence to the best of my ability. You know, like I think this is just one stop on my, you know, spiritual spaceship of a body and a soul. And I truly want to like be present in such a like lush and important way and exude that Mm. as an example. So. Oh, I love that so much. I got chills when you were talking about living into that liberation for my descendants. And it's not just, it's not just 
what will they be able to read that I wrote or what will they be able to watch that I was, you know, a podcast that I was on, but how did I actually live and that my living was a, it was a liberated way of living. And that was the, that was the, that was the example that was passed down, not just what I did, but how I was, how I be right in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. That just Mm -hmm. gave me, that gave me chills. And I'm really going to be sitting with that because sometimes we want to work so hard for those descendants who are coming after we're gone and we forget like you actually have to live your whole life and enjoy your life as well <laughs> mm-hmm. and that you what you're passing on is not just what you're giving them physically but how you showed up what you're giving them energetically in the way that you lived your life mm-hmm. totally i feel like my angelo i'm glad you brought her up yeah my daughter's um, named get- after her Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I feel like when I think of her, when I think of June Jordan, that's another ancestor that was coming to my heart. Mm-hmm. There was this way that they just lived like these free, yeah. like, like Suge Avery, who was like another one of my icons, even though she's not a fictional, she's a fictional right. person. But she is an icon. Like, yes. She is an icon to yeah. me. It's just like, you know, who wears lingerie most of the day, who likes to sing and likes to shake her titties and booty butt and all of the things, right. you know, I, yeah, I, that's the ans- kind of ancestor I am. I'm sure Gabriel yeah, for sure. I, yes. Yeah. Again, Queenie. I see Queenie. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh. Queenie is totally sure Gabriel energy all day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Janata, thank you. Thank you so much. And let's stay in touch. Yes. And next time you're in Minneapolis, we'll kick it. Whenever I make it to Qatar, we're going to kick it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Take care. This is Leila Saad, and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast. I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor Podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash good ancestor podcast. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being a good ancestor.